progress uh, thanks to what has been happening for the past few years. Uh, in average, uh, in our country now, we are raising over 30% uh, smartphone users, and the remaining is on, uh, on, on featured phones. However, our solutions are not really segregating. Uh, we do also consider those who are not lucky to have uh, smartphones. So I think as uh, an introduction, uh, that's uh, in the nutshell of what Vodacom is doing uh, on addressing connectivity uh, with regard to Tanzania. Thank you so much, um, particularly um, the sharing on the efforts in expansion of 2G, 3G, and 4G, and pretty much not leaving anyone behind. Um, I love how you mentioned that it's not just focused on people with smartphones, but essentially extended to others who can get it, and uh, um, the initiatives that you have in, in place to try to connect those as well. So that is a good way to start. Now, riding on the back of the expansion that is ongoing on 2G, 3G, and 4G, we want to come to you, Professor Noel, and ask about 5G, and particularly how can we tap into 5G for um, school connectivity? Now, we want the focus to be also around device and infrastructure. Um, somebody may argue, are we there yet? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, and I really like so, it. Uh, actually, I think it's a catch-21. It's like a chicken and egg, uh, which came first. So we understand the challenges that is happening not only in Africa, but also in most part of the uh, world when it comes to affordability. Uh, especially on these very good, very high-end uh, 5G devices. Now, uh, to give you an idea, uh, in Tanzania, even 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 the a bit of the devices is, is, is an issue. So, what we have realized, uh, and as, as a company, we saw that as a challenge, and we want people to enjoy the super uh, quality uh, because we understand all the use cases that are being uh, uh, unleashed on the 5G capabilities. So we came with a, a solution uh, of 5G routers, whereby with the same devices, people will be able, or, or, or customers will be able to enjoy 5G using Wi-Fi because of the router that we are offering. And those uh, routers are very high capacity routers. Uh, for example, one has got capacity to connect up to 300 devices. So we, we see that is a, a very good solution and there will be a game changer when it comes to not only home, but also to the office. So as we uh, continue addressing uh, affordability on devices, our partners, definitely uh, our, our routers will be the best uh, solution uh, in the Sorry about that, Mr. Ngubu. We are trying to have um, the support team mute the other voice so that we can hear you clearly. But um, we got the basis of your conversation right now on um, maximizing what resources are available to be able to provide the 5G, 5G services. We'll come back to you in a short while, and thanks for the submission. So I'll just go to Prof. Noll now to build on the same question. So we want to see also, just right in the back, um, as, as we've heard about um, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now what the efforts are for 5G. Um, I want ask if you are there yet with um, connecting um, schools, especially in rural areas, with 5G? I'd, I'd like to take the, uh, the opportunity to actually say that 5G has a very strong uh, technical perspective where we, uh, amongst others, have a network slicing concept which would uh, allow us to, to think completely and the thinking completely new from our academic perspective is to a uh, allow on 5g a network slice for the free access to information for everyone that is the number one number two is uh, and i'm thankful for your your input on the 5g devices because we actually see in the nordics that 5g is replacing copper uh, vdsl xdsl whatever lines and that means the access to schools from a 5g tower is a lot easier by what you say the external antennas supporting the 5g connectivity and the last but not least uh, the the chicken and egg between devices and knowledge i really believe that we first need to empower through community learning living labs the skills of women girls and under under underrepresented to get learning of what the digital beauty is of the services which help empowering people. 
And then the access technology, whether it's then 4G or 3G or 5G, is then a secondary aspect. But the tech to, uh, technology advances are there. And uh, the point which I'd love to bring to this table is that uh, we, we are looking forward to having a pilot with the universities, with uh, Vodacom, with others, with Yuxaf, and uh, uh, to, to discuss how we can actually pilot 5G access for schools. That is spot on. I love um, how we build up on what is uh, already existed for the community, essentially by empowering first and trying to move on to the technical aspects, which is um, the advances in 5G. So right now, um, trying our hands, but through a pilot would be pretty awesome to see what can what can happen, what needs to be done, what ought to be done, and to see the resources that um, probably would go into scaling this up in the near future. So thank you so much, Prof. No. And then also we move to Dr. Ismail, who um, will bring us a research perspective to our conversation. So Dr. Ismail, um, I believe is online. And if you can hear us, um, we want to know, uh, in fact, can we check if Dr. Ismail is online yet? You can say a word, you can say hello to us. Right. We don't seem to find him online. Um, right, so technical team, if you can give him permission to unmute, uh, please do or unmute him. And Dr. Ismail, can you say hi so we can hear you? Okay, we'll just do a quick um, move to our next speaker. I will come back to you, Prof, um, Dr. Ismail, for the aspect or perspective on research. So we'd want to go now to Madam Sandra, who is seated right close, right next to me. And, oh, sorry, she's online too. So I want to know, um, just also know if Sandra is online. Oh, she's seated by, yeah. The Vodacom team decided to meet in one space, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, so we see you. And Madam Sandra, we also have a question for you. Um, um, we just moved from what you've seen when it comes to essentially the, the conversation on 2G, 3G and all of that, and want to bring it back to Vodacom's efforts. So we want to know how Vodacom is working to ensure devices are available and are affordable to facilitate or advance connectivity. We've learned about what um, Prof. Sim or Prof. has described as empowering community before we can look at the technical advances. So as a first leg in, what is Vodacom doing for devices? Um, and also um, just to make sure it's, it's, it's affordable, what are some initiatives? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll warm greetings from me to everyone. So yes, uh, Vodacom is really working in the space of ensuring that uh, devices are available and they are follow, uh, affordable to, um, to, to the communities that we work in, but also uh, the customers. Uh, currently, unfortunately, we, 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 we know that the government has uh, reversed uh, our efforts uh, and has reintroduced back uh, the 18% uh, percent application on VAT. I remember last time on a similar forum, I had communicated that we had managed to convince the government to remove VAT on devices. Uh, but unfortunately, in the new financial year, they did put back the 18%, so that is a regression. However, Vodacom, we have mobilized ourselves very quickly to see how we can leverage our own partnerships internally, and especially to give facilities where uh, devices can be loaned, but also they can be uh, bought on a financing plan uh, using various partnerships. So those are the kind of uh, mechanism and schemes that we are working to ensure that uh, Tanzanians get uh, affordable devices. But also if for us in terms of uh, the social contract part, in terms of how we give back to our communities and create that social value, we do have programs that we run through our CSR arm, uh, where we ensure that we work with um, suppliers that can give us also affordable devices in terms of uh, the tablets and uh, computers to make them available to our public schools so that we can introduce um, digital education and digital skills uh, to schools at the end of the day. But um, also we have a, a special device uh, called Smart Kitochi, which is um, 
um, it, it costs about uh, 15 USD dollars. Um, it works uh, and it has the same capacity as a smartphone. So that's another pro, uh, product that we are really pushing to the masses to see how they can get connected and enjoy the same similar benefits of what a smartphone offers. So in general, those are the efforts that we are undertaking um, to, uh, to mitigate some of the current uh, environment that we are facing when it comes to uh, connectivity and ensuring that connectivity is um, sort of like an egalitarian uh, service <laughs> uh, to everyone, yeah. Spot on, and thanks for sharing the initiatives around um, even the loaner program where people can get devices and have it paid over time. I think that is um, a good one. And now the downside or the, or, the, or the part that is not too exciting is that reinstatement of what is 18%, which is almost like having everything you've built um, to a good extent crashed down in front of you. So we'll, bring that, we'll take that conversation up in a short while. We'll be asking about partnerships that is private and government, but I'll come back to you in a short while. So thanks for sharing. And and we applaud Vodacom's um, efforts in, in, in doing this. Thank you. So we want to come back to Prof. Moses. Can you hear us? And we'll just give you one chance again to say hi to us. If you can hear us, we'll um, give you a question before we move to Madam Justina. Can you say hi? Right. We can still seem to find um, or, or hear you, Prof. Ismail. So we'll come back to you, and if you can hear us at all, you can use the chat to say you are there, and we'll be back. So, Madam Justina, against that background, we are coming to the funding aspect, um, because you work at UCSAF, right? So we want to have the question for you about um, uh, funding, and we want to know how will the lack of funding um, affecting last mile community, um, last last mile connectivity in people um, in rural areas? Um, how does it essentially? The question you're trying to ask is how would how would that um, stifle the efforts that we currently see, and we are looking at it at, from a policy angle. So we are looking at it um, in terms of what you're doing, and I, I, that's your outfit, UCSAF, in influencing policy and funding. Right now, the issue is funding the very the very big elephant, and how are we overcoming it um, through policy? How is your outfit also um, influencing this change? A change in that area. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for being invited in this panel discussion, which is really important. And uh, on my side, because I'm always working in the villages, so it really makes a lot of sense when I talk about it. So as uh, the moderator introduced me, my name is Justina Mashiba. I'm the chief executive of the ESO Communication Service Access Fund. Um, this is a fund that has been uh, established by the, the government um, so that to bridge the digital gap between the and urban population. Uh, we all know that uh, um, the like of Vodacom are more interested in the villages. And, no, they are more interested in... Uh, in, uh, in uh, no, 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 urban cities and... Uh, they have less interest in uh, in rural areas. So uh, the government decided to establish this uh, this organization uh, so that we can try to, you know, um, bridge the, the the gap of those living in villages and those uh, living in, uh, in 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 urban areas. Um, so the way we we normally do is uh, as well not only communication service but also we are using ICT to bring also to bridge that. The, the digital gap. So what we normally do, we subsidize the uh, service uh, providers, the like of Vodacom, Tigo in Tanzania, and then uh, they go and roll out communication service. It's a partnership. And we are, when we are doing that, it's not like the government is giving the, the operator the whole amount of money. We are partnering in making sure that the, the rural population is getting communication services. Um, on top of that, um, like uh, Sandra said, um, when we are talking of public schools in Tanzania, I don't know, but I think it's in many African countries, it is just maybe the same. Uh, they are really don't have gadgets. When you're talking of computers, laptop, iPad, it is very um, rare to find them in uh, in some of the government schools. Not only government school, but when you're talking of government school in rural areas, that is another story. So. Um, 
we take we we decided to take the challenge of uh trying to connect those uh children in public schools especially in villages as i said when you're talking of public schools in tanzania they're like all underserved but you can think more about the children in rural areas so we 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 have tried to 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 do um, it's not much but we we are really trying to give them gadget and at the same time we are uh, uh, partnering with the uh, operators and the like of uh, African child to uh, connect the, the 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 gadget that we're providing with the internet so as I'm talking right now we have uh, uh, provide um, internet uh, no we have provide um, gadgets to more than uh, 1000 schools at the moment and we are we have also connected those schools with uh with the internet thank you to vodacom thank you to child african child because by ourselves there's no way we can do it as a government as a government we cannot do it by ourselves we need a collaboration we need a partnership with the private sector so that we can make sure like every tanzanian every child not only in tanzania but every child has access to internet you know nowadays when you're talking over internet internet is everything you can get money out of it you can learn you can do anything with the internet so the government is really welcoming all the private sector to partner together so that we can make sure all the the our children in uh, in uh, particularly in, in rural areas are are, are connected they, and they have a better 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 future and better education thank you Thank you so much. So we see the efforts in connecting historically underserved areas, and she mentioned the reality that there may be schools that, that, that are underserved. But to think about underserved schools in rural areas, then it gets even, um, it, it becomes a dire situation. So thank you for the efforts in, in, in connecting people and for also um, mentioning the need for partnerships. Governments on, on, on its own can do all of it. So the private sector and all others are uh, to show some commitment and then to have some um, progress towards connecting people across board. Now, on the background also of partnership and um, moving things forward, we have Mr. Barack Otiano who has done something around connecting schools um, in Kenya and has some work around the space. So now, Mr. Barack, we have some a question for you. Because you have done a work in this area, you just want to know what you have, uh, you have seen as challenges, opportunities, and maybe you can share best practices, um, essentially. And then we want you to also hone in on the issue of partnerships. Um, how can we get government buy-in in some of these initiatives? Thank you very much. Uh, not easy questions, but I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. Um, first and foremost, uh, morning, good afternoon, good Evening, everyone, especially those who are following us online. Um, as the moderator has uh, indicated, um, I represent on this panel a Herinet, uh, which is a community network uh, working in the western part of Kenya. And um, uh, a Herinet has indeed, uh, in partnership with the Basic Internet Foundation, uh, represented by Professor Noll here. Uh, connected 50 secondary schools uh, in Kenya. Uh, it was an interesting project in that uh, in 20, um, I think in 2019, 2020, when we uh, met Professor Noll, uh, together with my colleague Robert, uh, who is here, uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding to work together. Uh, we didn't know what lay ahead. <laughs> and I think, um, there were many issues uh, that were at the table which we had to unpack. Um, first, there was the issue of um, uh, what do we want to do? What is the objective of um, uh, the partnership that we went into? And uh, it was in um, bridging uh, the digital divide, ensuring that um, uh, information uh, can, that um, communities that were unable to access information are actually able to access this information affordably. Uh, there was an interesting uh, model that I met for the first time, uh, connectivity that had a freemium and premium model uh, of connecting to the internet. And a freemium model, um, uh, it assumed um, uh, the concept that any information that uh, is for the benefit of humanity, uh, especially on health, and on uh, social related issues should be accessed for free, the internet. 
and uh, of course the internet itself uh, given the role that it uh, plays in um, uh, social and economic development at least something should be paid for it so it fell under premium uh, but uh, it was one thing for us to discuss this it was another thing to take this to the community and the first lesson we learned is that the community entry process very important uh, fortunately in our team we had community development experts uh, hopefully my colleague later on will uh, speak to this uh, which made sure that in a way we were able to uh, penetrate uh, the community of course we leveraged on an already existing community uh, organization community initiative support services the other issue was community uh, engagement uh, it's not enough to just get into the community but you have to engage them communities have had ways of surviving uh, they've been using smoke uh, to provide direction so when you say that you are introducing google maps how how better or rather what benefits does it bring compared to for instance smoke or sometimes you know in the villages if you want to trace where there is a party uh, you just need to listen to the drums because in most cases it's very dark so already there was existing technology uh, which we were sort of challenging i think tied to this again was the issue of digital literacy we are bringing gadgets uh, into the community all of a sudden children know more than their parents because parents don't have time to go through the gadgets and understand how they are operating you go to the students know more than the team uh, basically technology is challenging the status quo so how then do we um, normalize this abnormal if i may use that term uh, then there was the issue of um, uh, infrastructure design uh, initially um, professor Noll would send us equipment that was fully configured uh, but uh, the moment it landed at the port it would take us six months to get the equipment if at all we are able to get it sometimes it would disappear so we had to change strategy and uh, ask ourselves are we able to configure uh, this equipment and deploy it so first we had to learn uh, this technology because it was coming straight from the factory and uh, secondly we had to figure out ways of deploying it in the community so it was uh, and remember even as we deployed in the community uh, it is such that in the rural areas uh, a primary school where you see a secondary school most likely there's a primary school because there's electricity in that place if you're serving a primary school you must also have the need uh, they are joining public facility uh, you know a school probably that hall is where public participation is done a lot of things are done within the community so we had to consider that in uh, infrastructure design uh, as we looked at the project and uh, when we landed uh, in the communities we realized that we have to pay for this service so it is not just about the glitz that you have brought the equipment uh, but there are bills to be paid and uh, because you're the one who brought this event uh, the community expects you to advise how the costs will be taken care of so as you can see it's not an easy journey or a straight journey and uh, just following on what uh, our speaker from Vodacom has said um, the more we started connecting people uh, our able uh, government also noticed that there's a new frontier for income so they not only introduce VAT but they also introduce excise duty which we are expected to pay faithfully and to pay promptly regardless of the fact that we are ensuring that communities are connected so that also meant that we have to arm ourselves with advocacy skills uh, to be in corridors of government uh, to meet policy makers uh, and also to understand how people arrive at VA, try and negotiate on behalf of the community. In any case, if you take away VAT, then how will government finance its operations? So even as we clamor or request government to take away some of these costs, we must have answers on how they will also be able to ensure that they are able to continue. So I think those are the uh, few that I would wish to submit, uh, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah. So essentially, we have had a roadmap sort of laid out for us on everything from entry to engagement 
to literacy, to cost, to re-strategizing, right? We see here how even at the cost of, con of innovation and connectivity, I mean, there can be hurdles that can come from governments and um, what can look like tax and all of that. So this is pretty much um, what you've seen as this, a way to launch into communities scale up and then to also have local um, partnership and inter international partnership like he has with um, Propno. So that is really spot on and thank you for sharing hands on what's happening in Kenya. So we now have a bit of time for some engagement, but um, would have questions. Oh, so Prop Ismail Moses, um, can you say if you can hear us, you can unmute and say hi to us. And then we'll yes, have a I think you. Hi, everybody. Uh, how are you doing? So this time, technology won, uh, won, and we're happy that you're on because we wanted to hear from you so bad. So now we've had the, from the angle of um, <laughs> the, the, the policymakers, the people on the ground, we want to hear from you from a research perspective or in academia. How important is research uh, for, I mean, connectivity of schools? What, how, what role can research play in the, in, uh, in the in the discussion around connecting schools. Yeah, so th thank you so much for having me. So um, basically, uh, as you uh, started there, we are a research institution. So what, what we do uh, now, what we are trying to do more closely now, more than ever, is bring together the stakeholders whom we haven't involved very much in our research in the past. So we understand that to harness the power of the internet, we have to address the barriers that hinder connecting the unconnected, especially uh, in the rural and the underserved areas. Uh, and these barriers include, as most people have said in this uh, uh, platform, uh, lack of broadband infrastructure, affordability, and handset and airtime. Uh, people don't talk much about airtime, but there have been a, a lot of discussion in the country lately, especially in Tanzania, about the affordability of service. Not, not uh, interesting, not only in rural areas, but also in urban areas, especially. Uh, most of these uh, claims have been coming from, from, from the urban areas. Uh, but as well, we know the issue of digital literacy and availability of local relevant content and applications. Uh, so so there, there, there's also the issue of business models for locally developed content and the apps that hinder innovations and development in this area. So, so, so these are the areas that we work in, uh, especially in the, in the College of ICT where, where I'm based in. Uh, we have uh, the research groups. We have, for example, the wireless research groups that specifically deal with uh, these kind of challenges. And uh, last year, we started uh, visiting the stakeholders, for example, TCRI, who are dealing with the regulation and policy. We have visited the UCSA, for example, who deal with uh, rural connectivity. And what we have, we have tried to, to look at, the operators as well, like Vodacom, we, we had a session with them, Nokia Siemens uh, as vendors, uh, Tigo. So in this operator space, we have, we have been engaging them. So what you've been looking at is, how can we uh, come up with the affordable means of uh, connecting the unconnected, especially in the rural areas. Because when you talk about connecting the rurals, uh, the business comes in. These organizations, these operators, they are working commercially. And one of the reasons why they, they, they fail to deliver these services at the rural is uh, the, the, the lack of uh, uh, commercial attraction, I would say, for, for these areas. So, so they wouldn't go there. And that is one of the reasons why we have UCSA, for example, uh, to, to subsidize uh, this, kind of, this kind of services uh, for the rural areas. So, so we, want to, we want to look at how we can uh, come up with affordable affordable solutions, so affordable uh, technologies, for example, connectivity solutions and technologies uh, in the broadband infrastructure. Uh, and people don't talk much about it, the transport network solutions, for example, for the back hall and front hall. I'm using a bit of our technical jargons here, but basically that means we have to not only reach the last mile, but of course the, the, the transmission of that information to go to, uh, to the, to the uh, 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 switches, for example, and the core network, uh, in this case, uh, servicing and provisioning of, of, those, of those solutions. So, so we need to have, like, how can we come up with affordable means to provide all these solutions? Because if we address all this in entirety, that is when we can come up with... Uh, 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 
sorry, I'm getting, I'm using my mobile phone, so people calling. So, so, so those kind of services, customer support systems, for example, but the most important thing that you are looking at is the business models and the strategies, because we know the connectivity solutions come in so many forms. The technology, of course, we, we see that changing now and then, but then when it comes to saving the rural areas, we need to, to bring in innovation. What are they? Because sometimes it could not be the technology issue. It could be, for example, the innovation that we need to, to bring in to come up with a different set of business models that are uh, strategies that can reduce the price or can re, can make the, the services affordable. So these are the areas that we are we are working on, and we are very glad to have worked with, for example, uh, some of these uh, uh, operators and uh, stakeholders like TCRI and UXAF and even the government. Like now we are working with the government uh, in the TV white space, which is one of the technologies to, uh, that is uh, tainted that it could bring uh, the, the cost of connectivity down, especially for rural areas. And we, what we are doing exactly now is to look at how can TV white space come in and bring down the cost. The affordability is the key issue here. How can we make the, the, the connectivity and broadband services uh, affordable? And that is, that is an area that you are working and we are glad that uh, different initiatives are coming on board and uh, we are we are extending a helping hand as well and that could be a short uh, a shortcut for us also to to ensure that we achieve this goal thank you thank you so much for sharing um, and for the perspective on even um, bringing stakeholders to the to the core of your research I mean you can do the research but now stakeholders feed into the process so more of um, getting just information like that would be helpful for whatever you want to roll out and great work on the alternatives to connectivity like exploring tv white spaces and seeing how that can make um connectivity also affordable so that is spot on and thank you for sharing and for right tracing that research is helpful for us to be able to um find what is a, is a problem or to that i uh, understand it and to plan appropriately to be able to um solve it as a stunt so we have gone into the conversation and if you're just joining we are talking Talking about connectivity everything about it we've moved from the device angle to the research to funding to policy um even underlining stuff like partnerships too so we want to allow the flow for people to speak briefly and we want you to have questions so that our speakers can attempt um, them and then you can also give your suggestions so if you have any questions online please put up your hand we'll give you the floor to, to speak if you also have any um, questions in the room kindly put on your hand and just move close to the microphone with allow you the chance to ask your question. So any questions at the moment or contributions? Online. In the, in the room, anybody um, with best practices or, I mean, ideas for school connectivity, if you don't have any, would go back to our speakers. Oh, you have one. Okay. Kindly move close the microphone and we can take your contribution. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Owino. I'm a co-director with Barak at Aherinet. And uh, our experience, I think there's some reflections that I would like to share on our experience uh, in Kenya. Uh, the first one is to reiterate that this is not something that one entity can do. I have to identify or map out the institutions and uh, what aspects or uh, parts they need to contribute to achieving connectivity. Uh, and uh, I, I will draw parallels probably with uh, Tanzania and Kenya, which I'm relatively knowledgeable about. And uh, we have to speak to power and ask the powers that be that they need to support connectivity. It is to their own benefit, it's to the benefit of the society. Secondly, um, as much as uh, we have spoken about the freemium model. I don't think from a development perspective that there's anything that is free. It could be free, but somebody has to pay for it. And so this is a challenge we have with uh, communities, particularly rural communities, because the gaps are so diverse. Um, if you think of uh, one entity sorting it out, it may not be possible. One school may not have a fence. The next school doesn't have electricity. The next school doesn't have a teacher who is knowledgeable. So 
And, and that brings me to the last uh, point I want to reflect that whatever solutions has to be flexible, meet the various needs of each community. We are talking about uh, uh, diverse communities, but we have seen also a process where we want to a convergence of approaches, which may not necessarily work uh, towards uh, our objective. And, and finally, I'd like us to consider internet as a public good. And just like roads, there's nobody who builds his own road, or at least generally, there's nobody who builds his own hospital, and there's nobody who provides their own water system. So um, uh, internet is a public good, and we should then contribute, and all partners need to contribute to this. And finally, we need to have um, a policy framework to be able to accommodate all this, because then, uh, um, like we are talking about connecting communities, and the com it's not just about connectivity. What are they using the connectivity for? We have schools, then use it for uh, learning management systems, if it's communities, that they will use it for economic benefit or improving the economic status. If it is health, that we'll be able to share health information appropriately. So uh, at, the end of, at the end of it all, let's look at uh, uh, usability of the connectivity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So th that's a lot and um, other points really drive home um, the need to partner for us to look into diverse um, conversations or di the diverse needs of people um, to be able to provide for them what will help them and then to ensure that what they're doing is helpful for what they intend to um, do with it, whether education or development. Now, while you were speaking, Prof. Nell signaled, he wanted to add something to what you said, I, I guess. So. Quite, quite surely, in order to avoid the interference, we have one mic microphone. Could you switch that off? Yeah. Um, Robert, thanks a lot for your input on the internet as a public good. Uh, you know, uh, from my experience, uh, having been in the telecom business, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to our friends from uh, Vodacom uh, saying, how, how do you earn money? Because like in my old times in, in the telecom services, money was done by international roaming, by SMS, and let me be rude, by sex and drugs and rock and roll. Uh, so there is a good sales market of these kind of services, whereas you don't sell on health, you don't sell on education, you don't sell on, uh, on any governmental services. And that subdivision made me always think of Yes, I can get boys to pay for soccer. I can get, uh, sorry, being a bit gender biased, to get girls to pay on uh, watching sales for uh, for clothes or Bollywood or or the newest whatever. So I'm I'm there a bit on uh, how do we bring this public goods discussion into the discussion of what really empowers the community. I love that um, the, the conversation is now going on and Vodacon team is smiling. Um, did you want to react to this? <laughs> yeah, I had to smile because he really uh, uh, now brought a very good uh, uh, challenge uh, with regards to how can we publicize uh, something that we need to pay. And uh, definitely uh, the cost of uh, really producing uh, one MB even now in Tanzania is higher than what we are selling. However, as you heard from my, my colleague, uh, Sandra, uh, when, when it comes to school, it's a special uh, uh, area. For us, as I say, uh, it's a purpose-led organization whereby we believe for connecting for a better future. And there's no better future than addressing the right of health, uh, education, and sector, especially on the public school. So we have a platform that's called Connect You, whereby as we speak in Tanzania, we have zero rated more than 10 websites. Out of those, uh, seven are from education, uh, three from health. And this uh, happened all the way when we had uh, the pandemic. So we have a way on how we can really uh, deliver uh, our purpose and uh, how can we empower uh, our community. And that we've been doing not only uh, on issuing uh, free connectivity, but also we do have another program that is addressing again the community by empowering their knowledge. So we do also run a special program uh, for free to get uh, uh, youth in Tanzania 
uh, who are eager to to innovate and uh, uh, attain their dream uh, on of, without any uh, cost. So we have another program as well, Vodafone well, Digital Acceleration, that also addresses not only connectivity. So I really uh, 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 like to recommend, uh, and I really uh, 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 like the comment from Robert that we need to go beyond the connectivity. And for us, we are uh, more than a network. So we go also beyond the connectivity. We provide more use cases that addressing uh, and, get, and, and get, uh, the users to, 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 to believe that and hence uh, adopt the solution. We have seen when we introduced mobile uh, services, uh, the adoption was remarkable, like bushfire, all the way from urban even to the rural areas. So we want to get the learnings from where uh, we, 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 we had uh, the, the milestone and uh, make the same on the internet uh, adoption uh, point of view. So we, we have the way to get those, uh, not, not for the lack of a better term, not vulnerable, but those who are on the disadvantaged side when it comes to uh, accessing internet. As Robert said, I think internet, uh, the, I had uh, even uh, Madame Justina, the CEO of Yusuf, uh, re reiterating that uh, internet now is the new oxygen. So for us, we understand that. And uh, for sure, uh, using what you have uh, said and uh, what uh, our, 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 our fundamental and when it comes to social contract, we'll be able to deliver while uh, uh, providing back to shareholders for sustainability. Otherwise, we don't want to close our company in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, like I said, the conversation is ongoing. And in this room, we also have Mr. Barak, who works with uh, Mr. Roberts, wanting to uh, submit to this conversation. So the floor is yours at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, just to pick up from uh, where the uh, previous speaker has left, um, we are dealing with a very complex subject, and I want to touch on a few things. Uh, if you look at the history and the progression of the internet connectivity, um, initial deployment was uh, heavily funded, subsidized uh, by public money, public interest money. And uh, I think as we move on, one of the things that is evident is that um, first, uh, Spectrum is a public good, and um, the interest of the public should come first when we are deploying Spectrum. And uh, there should be uh, an element of uh, openness uh, in how uh, Spectrum is handled uh, at local. It needs a bottom-up approach, for lack of a better word. Uh, because when you think about it and when you look at uh, the scenarios we are dealing with, where the confusion is coming in, in uh, most of the economic models that we are using are not homegrown even when it comes to deployment of the infrastructure that we are talking about. Currently, we are talking of, of the Universal Service Fund. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and I hope uh, Madam Chair can correct me here, most of the countries in the African region and in the global south are struggling with how to put this Universal Service Fund into proper use. Not because the funds have not been collected, but because the rest, we do not have adequate... Uh, mechanisms of ensuring that this fund is actually utilized at the ground. And uh, we at Aherinet uh, in Kenya are engaging with our regulator, the Communications Authority, and of course the other community networks under the Community Network Initiative uh, to make sure that uh, um, we rethink the way the Universal Service Fund is actually used for the benefit of the citizens. The elephant in the room has been those who have been contributing to the Universal Service Fund uh, feel that they are the ones who should be able to utilize this universal fa service fund, which is fair enough. But on the other hand, um, most of the time, these are corporates whose core business is return on investment, not infrastructure. And I underline return on investment. And so I am struggling to figure out how they will go into these areas that do not have any return on investment. And we see cases of a lot of infrastructure deployed across the continent, which is unused, dead infrastructure. We set up towers and we switch them off as soon as we've set them up. And community members still have to climb on trees or walk long distances to find connectivity. In this day and age, when we are talking of 5G, 
yet we are talking of public resources or public money which is very opaque so i think the issue of uh, spectrum has to be bottom up just the way we discuss boundaries of land we should discuss spectrum and related boundaries currently we are most community networks are using the industrial scientific and medical band uh, 2.4 5.8 they are clogged yeah most of this there's too much noise in those spectrums there are conversations around opening up 6g and 5g these are public resources they should be subjected to um to public participation processes so that the public then determines how best they can be used in any case most of these regulatory bodies are are a creation of uh, constitutional processes that are in themselves put in place by citizens so i think what i am trying to drive at is that community has to come first when we are discussing infrastructure community has to understand uh, the spectrum that is available and uh, what is being done about uh, the particular spectrum and community has to be involved from the onset in any solutions that are then designed for them and i think if we are talking of that uh, the little universal service fund that we are struggling with will triple it or quadruple it to millions of shillings and the grass will be enough for all of us we will not even be fighting about uh, who should be apportioned what amount of universal service fund i submit right so i allow the mention of right how complex this is and the conversations that should go into it and who should be involved and even the particular mention of things that have been deployed but probably not being used and what happens after these funds have been secured so while you're speaking i also got a signal that madame who is the ceo of the ucsaf wants to respond and then we'll go to catherine and just to say the online folks we allow you to also ask if you have any questions please prepare to do so Thank you, Baraka. Um, I want to start where Baraka ended. <laughs> uh, when he was talking about the Universal Service uh, Fund that is available um, in Tanzania, I'm running short of fund. What I can say, I'm telling you, I'm running out of fund because we have a lot and we are doing a lot uh, in Tanzania. Um, for us, we have a very good uh, cooperation with the operators. So like we don't have any white elephant. In Tanzania, we don't have any white elephant because what we normally do, we engage with operators and we, dis we, we, we discuss and agree on a way forward. So we just don't go and, you know, put an infrastructure and no one is going to use it. For, so, and I guess maybe uh, Tanzania USF is one of the, the, the USF that is doing very good because we have a lot of uh, benchmarking uh, visits in Tanzania, like last week we had somebody from uganda and we have we have a request from sierra Leone and everyone so i think it's one of the one of the usf that we are really trying uh, very good to engage operators and stakeholders in whatever that we are doing and um what i can say um when you're talking of uh, uh, uh population in rural areas we should really think of when you're talking of internet um you know, a person don't even have a shilling to buy a bread. And now you're telling him to go and buy internet for whatever. So from this point, I think it's very important to, you know, keep on uh, educating the, the society, keep on engaging the society, so that at the end of the day, when we go and roll out the project in the villages, in the rural areas, it will be easy for them to accept and, you know, sometimes be willing also to, to contribute some uh, some amount in uh, getting the service. So what I can say even for, for those who are doing business, uh, we know that it's a business, but at the end of the day, as one of the, uh, the contributors was saying it's it's like a, it's now a public service when you're talking of public good uh, it, it should be very cheap that everyone can can afford but once you make it expensive uh, and when you're talking of rural population i'm a hundred percent that at the end you just get having a, a lot of white elephant and no one is using it so thank you very much Thank you so much for that. And the conversation has been ongoing. Now, Catherine, I want to take you quickly. And then is there any question online? OK, um, so good good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining the session. Very interactive. Um, so again, to you, Madam Justina, um, since you represent the government on this panel, um, I think most of us <laughs> have been um, a victim of policy, the, the, the policy and, and regulations that still 
back us up in a corner when it comes to connectivity in rural areas mostly and the reluctance of the government to change their policies and regulations um, in terms of I would speak um, in regards to school connectivity um, because the the program itself um, involves digital um, digital learning to students and then you'd have a program such as school connectivity involves multi-sectoral um, um, or different ministries that are involved. If I'm Minister of ICT, uh, Minister of Education, and I would say also Minister of Finance. But then again, at the end of the day, um, you'd have policies being made um, from all these different ministries don't speak to one another um, when, when it comes to um, sustainability of the program, implementation of the program, even the lifeline of the program after after the donors exit, I would say from the goodwill of maybe Vodacom or, or basically internet after the exit plan, what comes next? And also we have um, different policies that are still working against us um, in terms of um, sustainability of the program. But then again, um, in, even implementation, because we have um, good policies on paper, um, or in some countries we don't even have good policies on paper, but still the reluctance of the government to change in, in accordance to times that we are in on how do, we, how do they embrace um, digital learning in schools, because I think there's one time we attended um, a, mini, a meeting in the ministries and they would ask us, um, if you are to choose between building a class and paying for internet, what would you select? So I think it's it's questions like those that still made us make, makes us question like um is the government really embracing um technology in this time and era or is is it still um a battle um from your end what do you what's your take on that thank you catherine that is a difficult one but i'm trying i'll really try to 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 answer your question um you know as i said before uh, a person maybe in a village you don't have a shilling to buy a bread so now when you're talking of internet we are now trying to you know uh, change the mindset you know uh, and in tanzania for instance because of the 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 need or the importance of uh, having a an ict that's why we have now a full-fledged ministry you can do remember before it was just a, um, a section what i can say it was just a section within a ministry but now we have a full-fledged ministry that is dedicated 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 in issues related to ict so so when when you're talking of uh, um uh, for instance school connectivity uh, you have like um, how many ministries do you have to go three minutes because we have minister of finance we have a local government minister of uh, education local government and then we have a ministry of ict so it is really sometimes very tough everyone has his own priorities when you go to the local government for them, they want to build classrooms. When you come to the ICT, it's now at least we have ICT. The minister, they can stand and you, you say, you know, we have to push this agenda of ICT. When you go to the Minister of, uh, of, of Education, he's interested in, in getting maybe the books, whatever, that it's important for, for, for the ministry. So what I can say, um, uh, stakeholders' engagement is key. And I do remember, Catherine, we were starting this uh, uh, project. We 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 really needed to engage all the stakeholders. If you don't have engaged the stakeholders and they don't understand what you're doing, it will, it will be very difficult to, you know, to sail through. So what I can say um, on the issues related to uh, policies and the way of doing business, it is very difficult, for instance, in our country of 31 uh, region and more than 6 million population. You, you can see how difficult it is, but nowadays, uh, at least the, the, the government is flexible. We are really open to engage with uh, private sectors so that at least we can see things are moving. For instance, now in Tanzania, we have a, a spatial program. We call it a digital, digital Tanzania. So when we are talking of digital Tanzania, it's now the responsibility of Ministry of ICT to make sure like everything that has to deal with ICT Path through the Minister of ICT. Before it was like, you know, scattered everywhere. You go to the Minister of Finance, they, are, they have the ICT department and they think their ICT department is even higher than the, the other ICT department. So um, I, I think right now the, the, the government is in a very um, a good track or in the right track of making sure that like now everything, when you're talking of, 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 of a issue, any issue related to ICT, you just go to the ministry responsible for ICT. 
it is tough i know catherine but we are we are heading there and i hope soon we'll be in a, in a different world and we'll be talking now of uh, digital tanzania in tanzania thank you right thank you so we, we are running short on time uh prof no would, would say something and then we'll pick a question oh there is a question Tayo. yeah you can yeah thank you madam mm -hmm. chair my apology for coming late session so um let me before my submission let me quickly use this opportunity to invite everyone of you to actually visit our booth uh, african um, open data and internet research we actually had a discussion here uh talking about um internet uh backpack that you can take to your remote villages rural to connect um the people in your remote environment so you you asked me oh we don't have inter uh, ele electricity, so we have an option for that. So please visit our booth and actually um, look at the demonstration of the internet backpack. And also, we are also having um, a launch of that. Please, uh, we we'll, we'll invite you to that. So um, my questions or my submission, when we talk about connectivity, we tend to forget about the rural, urban poor and how they communicate and um, in terms of language barrier. And so these are the things that we need to actually bring to the table when we talk about connectivity. So look at content. If we had to have that impact, we must think like um, the rural urban poor and their needs, their wants, and the affordability of that and the sustainability of it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So do you want to respond now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can jump in on that. And uh, I love your input because I really think when it comes to internet and mobile, we need to think differently in Africa. Because the story is, Africa is so big, and building the infrastructure, and then Guyu and uh, Justina will agree, is building the infrastructure is so expensive. At the same time, the, the earnings is a lot lower than we, had, we have in Western economies. I mean, to give you an example, I pay like, uh, $50 for the fixed plus another $30 for the mobile, that means $70 per month. And that is just the internet uh, for mobile and fixed in, in Norway. Now, when I think of that further and I say, I have a dollar or $2 a month for connecting, doesn't it mean that we have to rethink differently, that we need to empower a lot more what we call a decentralized internet, where we in our communities, build what we call the community learning living labs where people can come to and where they can find local content and they can contribute to local content what is of important and have the free access and that one will lift the economies and hopefully then also lift the uptake of mobile broadband and also de the deployment of the expensive network but that is a different work where we currently, together with uh, Barak and Robert and some others, work on a scientific paper. And I'm inviting you, you to uh, to join us there with some data from Vodacom. Uh, I, I, I also got the commitment here from Safaricom in Ethiopia to help us with some data that we really, from the science perspective, can uh, underlie the different culture. Right. So on that background and essentially what you've heard about thinking differently when it comes to the African con um, continent, um, we're going to, I know we were sharing a report on this um, session. So for people who are looking at expansion or looking at extension of connectivity to rural areas, we've had some points here, which are pretty generic, but can, can be contextualized for your particular situation. So we're going to move um, the conversation further. And like you said, there's an invitation to join even a research paper and it will be exciting for us all to see what we found out um, by way of just moving forward the connectivity and especially connectivity in schools in rural areas. Now, a special thank you to all sp speakers, um, those online, um, the Vodacom team and also Prof Ismail and, and as uh, we are going to now come to our, our speakers here who will just give us in one sentence a tech home so you're going to round up on that because our time is already up so um, if I say anything we should remember out of this session Mr Barak you go first in one line <laughs> thank you research should precede policy and policy should guide infrastructure deployment those are my concluding remarks. Can someone tweet this quickly? <laughs> right. Yes, that's how we go. 
what I can say is partnership is key. Hmm. No. For me, it's really the youth empowering our dreams. Mm, absolutely. So thank you so much. But I come team, one line each, Sandra and you. I think for us, connectivity or technology without human is nothing. Mm. We'll continue connecting for a better future and changing people's life through our technology. And they will go beyond the connectivity. Right. Okay, that can fit in the tweet. Now let's see you, Sandra, one line. Um, for us, we believe technology can address some of the pr most pressing issues uh, in our country. Absolutely. Prof. Ismail, one line. Yeah, so uh, for me, basically, it's innovation. So we know the solutions exist here. They will keep on existing technology will advance. But of course, African challenges can be solved through innovation mm. uh, and not reinventing the wheel. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, we just want to appreciate you all for being an awesome um, um, at attendee audience and for just um, listening and contributing. So thank you all. We end with a cloud applause. We just forgot to thank we just forgot to thank Catherine for organ organizing this session yes and the support team and everybody <laughs> thank you Recording in progress. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Please permit me. Just give me one minute um, of your time. Just wanted to um, tell you about um, Namcom. Uh, I can Namcom is actually looking for leadership um, people that want to take leadership um, uh, opportunity in 